This is a HeadGum Podcast. Hey, this is Steph Firewell. Join me by Weekly at the Lemonade for all things nerdy and geeky, giving you all the sweet and sour notes from the nerd world, as well as my own special commentary to make this blend lemonade just right. Follow the Lemonade at Audio Boom SoundCloud, High Bean at the Points of Interest Network, and I'll see you guys soon. Hi everyone, I'm teaming up with the website Rewire.news to explore the intersection of their work and mine on a brand new podcast called Get It Right. On Get It Right, we explore pop culture through the lens of justice, and particularly reproductive justice. I'll be talking to critics and creators about comics, movies, TV, music, anything is fair game. You can find it now on iTunes or Stitcher, to search for Get It Right or Rewire. Give it a listen and drop us a review with any ideas for what you'd like to hear us cover. See you soon. Shannon, CG, Lauren, and Mel form the Nerds of Prey. A group of ladies bonded by comics, gaming, film, television, and fandom culture. Hang out with them bi-weekly as they dig into the very things that make them loud and proud nerds. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play. Also, check out their Patreon at patreon.com backslash nerds of prey. Right, you know what it is, what it was, what it will be. It's your main man, Jason Mitchell. Go see Kong Skull Island on March 10th, and you are rocking with Black Girl Nerds. Hey, this is Kim Whitley from Next Friday. You know sugar, and you're listening to Black Girl Nerds. Yeah, they really are, y'all. Yeah, this is Lewis Tan from Marvel's Iron Fist. Uh, this is Black Girl Nerds. You guys are amazing. I love you guys to death. Check out the podcast. Check out the show. Let's get busy. Hey, this is Eric LaSalle. You're listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. I'm Marcus Scribner from Blackish, and you're listening to Black Girl Nerds. Hey, I'm Jean Grey. I'm a polymath. If you don't know what that is, look it up. This is Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Yeah. Hello, this is Jordan Peele, the director of Get Out, and you are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hello, this is the uh, 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. And you are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. of the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. My name is Jamie, and I am your host. This episode is titled, The Quad, Fits and Starts, and HBO's Insecure. Three segments. In our first segment, we invite writer, director, and TV showrunner Felicia D. Henderson. Felicia is the TV showrunner of BET's new series called The Quad, and she sits down with us on a one-on-one. That segment is hosted by yours truly, Karan, Tora, and Joy. In our next segment, we head on over to South by Southwest. We had a fantastic time at South by, and stay tuned for more podcast episodes featuring several interviews from the conference. 
And this segment features Jacqueline and the cast and crew of Fits and Starts. This segment features Laura Teruso, actor Wyatt Cenac, and Greta Lee. In our third segment, Karan sits down with two actors from HBO's hit series Insecure. She chats with actor Jay Ellis, who we know as Lawrence, and actress Lisa Joyce, who plays Frida. So that's our show. Sit back, relax, and enjoy it. Spread the word about the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Use Twitter and use our hashtag BGM podcast. That puts you in the feed with everybody else that is talking about this show. So enjoy BGN 107, The Quad, Fits and Starts, and HBO's Insecure. Felicia D. Henderson is a TV producer, screenwriter, and comic book writer, also the director of music videos and TV episodes. She's worked on Moesha, Sister Sister, Soul Food, and Fringe. She was a writer for DC Comics, including the series Teen Titans and Static Shock. Currently, you can find her work on BET's new show called The Quad, a TV drama that stars actress Anika Noni Rose, who plays the role of Dr. Eva Fletcher, a newly elected president of the fictional Georgia A&M University. And just a quick production note on Felicia's interview. She did have to stop abruptly. She was filming a new show at the time of the recording, so it will end abruptly. Uh, So I do apologize for that, but you will hear more from Felicia in the future, and when she promotes her new show, we'll have her back on the podcast. Welcome to this segment of the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. My name is Jamie. I am your host. Very excited to have this guest with us on tonight. If you are a fan of BET's new show called The Quad, you're certainly going to enjoy this segment. We have TV showrunner Felicia D. Henderson, who is the executive producer behind and creator behind the series The Quad on BET. Felicia, thank you so much for coming on the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It was As you were introducing me, I was having such a hard time not just jumping in and going, yay, I'm finally here, I'm finally here. <laughs> <laughs> we are so glad you're finally here. It feels like it's a long time coming. I know you've been following the account for so long now. and I have. I feel like I was one of your OG followers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> And we also have on the show with us our lovely co-hosts, Karan, Joy, and Tora. Thank you, ladies, for coming on. Thank you. I'm excited. Thank you. (laughs) So, I, you know, this show, The Quad, is amazing. It's a show that follows the life of a historically black college and university president and its students. And you created this Mm -hmm. series along with Charles Holland. And I, I wanted to know what led you to this particular project and... How much research did you put into this to make sure that it was accurate to the way we see HBCUs today? Um, God, that is such a good question. And um, I'm so excited to be doing it. And I think that the research, uh, when I first started it, I I spent so much time. I think I have like 100 pages of research. A lot of it just, you know, news stories and different things and going to websites of, you know, probably 25 uh, HBCUs and reading everything from mission statements to what students had to say. And then, of course, everything you can find. And then, of course, there's the people research. And um, having uh, having had a niece and a nephew be educated at HBCUs and then a ton of friends. And then, of course, way back when Charles and I were writing the script, before we even started, Having eight, having BET executives who were educated at HBCUs, of course, slyly start to give us their stories, you know, <laughs> and things that that was their experiences. So it was like, oh, you're so excited about this. Let me tell you what happened to me, you know. <laughs> so that was all like so research sort of you, we, we did our own, but it also kind of just came to us Um and so that was excited and, and exciting and always remembering to my first experience or the first HBCU campus I ever stepped onto, which was Howard. Um, and just what that feeling was as a girl from Los Angeles, 
um, you know, on my first trip to Washington, D.C., and really, and to, you know, visit the White House. And what I remember most is like, I just want to get to Howard because I just wanted to see this thing where it's like it's all black people, you know, in the college environment. And I remember I was in high school stepping on that campus and being transformed and being overwhelmed with this sense of pride and I, I want to be a part of this, and this is amazing. And to just look around and say, every person I see looks like me and is here for an education. That was something that stayed with me for years and years. And um, and I never lost that. Even when we stepped on the campus of Morehouse to shoot this show, I felt it all over again, particularly when you see you know, young Black men and knowing we're all here, they're all here for the same purpose. And just what I feel about education and, you know, and how education changes lives. It it's, makes you so proud and just overwhelms you with sort of excitement and, 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 and pride to be there. Well, as an HBCU graduate, uh, shout out to Norfolk State University, Spartans represent. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really refreshing to see black college life back on television again. Uh, so to, yeah. I, I feel like I'm reliving some of my experiences watching this show. And uh, you have another uh, star of this show who's actually a Black Girl Nerds podcast alumni, Anika yeah. Noni Rose. <laughs> yeah. She is yes, our girl. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I'm a, I'm a bigger black girl nerd than you are. I think that's the really adult conversation that I had with her about that. <laughs> <laughs> like before you start, I just want you to know how big of a nerd I am. Um, well, can you describe to us Anika Noni Rose's character of Dr. Eva Fletcher and what your thoughts of her being compared as an Olivia Pope type that runs the Georgia a and University? Oh, that's so interesting. I hadn't heard that comparison yet. But I think that um, I'll just tell you how, sort of where where the the impetus for that character and it being her. Really, we've been working on this since, believe it or not, like almost four years before it ever came to the screen. Um, and so for me, it was on the heels of the first the 2008 and then the 2000. 12 um, elections where I still was thinking about Hillary Clinton and, and the run against Barack Obama and, you know, those ideas of, you know, the cracks in the glass ceiling. And so I, I was just so fascinated with this idea of what does it mean to be a woman now, today, where we think, you know, there's gender equality, um, to come into a very male and a very historically male and, you know, state environment that no woman has ever been in before. The, 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 our fictitious school, Georgia A&M, has never had a woman president. So this is a woman who comes from, who's from Connecticut and she comes from money. She comes from a wealthy family. Then she, you know, met her, her husband in college and, he, she got her PhD in education or in philosophy, and he got, you know, a, a law degree and, and eventually became a judge. And they have one child. But I also, you know, wanted to explore the idea of this assumption like, well, we're all black. So if I bring my Connecticut self down to, you know, the South, surely we'll all, it'll all be fine. But just looking at sort of intra race issues. And the fact that it isn't fine and that a Connecticut, you know, upper class black is not the same as a Southern black and not saying all Southern blacks are the same either, but that she had a lot to learn. So, um, you know, of course, typical fish out of water journey, but the specificity of it is that this is a um, wealthy and upper class woman who is a northerner, um, not a, assuming that she would have a lot in common with these people in the South. And she does not, they don't want her. She's surprised to find that they don't want her there. Wow. I'm Tora. Um, thank you so much for um, Hi, coming Tora. on. I'm such a great fan of the quad so far. I'm so excited um, to see HBCUs represented so well on screen. Um, thank first, you. <laughs> 
problem. First question. So um, you kind of touched on it already, but um, there is great debate surrounding the whole HBCU versus PWIs. Um, And Mm -hmm. I do notice within the show, there's this running theme around Dr. Fletcher's contentioned blackness and gatekeeping of blackness because of her Mm -hmm. Ivy League background. So Mm -hmm. what do you hope um, current or alumni attendees of both PWIs and HBCUs will learn while watching the show? Mm, that's such a good question. Thank you. Um, you know what? I hope that, you know, like, as you know, um, I, I I went to UCLA or say, as you know, like, you know, maybe don't know, but I went to UCLA. <laughs> and so um, I think that I all I want to do is to, you know, shine a light on all of our flavors, all of our, you know, all of our differences all of our and difference not being a negative thing so so often difference is talked about as if it is negative Mm -hmm. and i talk about difference and i think of difference um you know as an area where there are things that we have to share about each other that we don't know um things that you can learn about me and things that i can learn about you so difference is not negative to me. And it is what, of course, makes the world interesting. And it certainly is what makes drama and drama writing interesting. So I hope that what people will learn is sort of what Black folks already know, is that we're not monolithic. Mm. I hope that all types of Black people will be happy to see themselves represented. I hope that, you know, that, like you said, this area around, you know, cont- Con- this contentious idea, the idea of being a contentious one of this woman who's this kind of black is different from this kind of, you know, person over here is who's a different kind of black, that that difference is OK. And that even if we start in different corners, you know, as we uh, the show goes on, that we start to find how we are, how difference is not the enemy. And that respect of differences should be the goal as opposed to we must all be the same. I love that. I'm certainly excited to see um, us explore that throughout the series. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I'm sure, well, maybe you don't. (laughs) pay attention to um, the news media, but um, I did notice that there was (laughs) an open letter from some of the the HBCU (laughs) presidents. No, say it isn't so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of them had their... um, their little, they were in a tizzy um, and they were disavowing the quad as kind of being non-representative of HBCU life. And I wondered what your response to that was initially and what, mm. and would you say there's a parallel between HBCU leaders meeting with Trump about this executive order and the mm. hard decisions Dr. Fletcher is forced to make for GAMU? Mm. Oh my God, that is loaded. <laughs> take a breath you don't have think that about kind it of time. I'm like think about it think about it um, you know what I think that um, I here's the here's the thing with with me and where I where I stand is that truly um, I'm so proud of what we do and I'm also so comfortable with opinion opinions being different and that someone feeling like they don't necessarily find what they need. I'm interested in those people. I'm interested in the why. Um, I hope that if you're going to make a decision about the show, that you, it is an informed one. So like you, maybe you watch a few episodes. Um, (laughs) I hope that, um, and I, and I guess I know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? I know what my goal is. I know the joy I feel when the I can look around and say, wow, this crew, which is an A-list amazing crew, you see the show and what it looks like, um, mostly looks like me. So I think I'm so proud of what we're doing that I'm okay with people not being happy with it. It's not going to be for everyone. It would be probably boring if we tried to be everything to everyone. So this is a, you know, so I I don't, you know, 
I don't know. And I also look at it as an opportunity, I guess, to teach. You know, I'm a teacher in my soul. I teach at UCLA. I think that for me, if I have a issue with it, I my goal is always, you know, to to teach. You know, I'm I'm a, a very active aunt in the lives of my nieces and nephews, and so I try to make decisions that show them what you do when you don't like something. And so I think that's always about communication. What would I've done if I didn't like it and I was, you know, in a, in a place of academic learning? I would say, I'm going to bring this person here and talk to me and talk to my students so we can have a debate, so we can start a dialogue so that I can make sure I understand what they are trying to do before I decide I don't like it. I want to make sure that the things I say about it are actually correct. Um, so that's what I would have done. Um, but at the same time, I don't put a lot of focus on it because I know what we are actually doing and I know how I feel about my people. I'm such a happy and proud person to be in my black skin. Um, I know the amount of black folks who have jobs because we are doing this show. I know how many, you know, we're interested in diverse opinions about storytelling. So, you know, in the writer's office itself, in the writer's room, I think we have, you know, our, from everyone from our production assistant went to Howard, um, Charles Holland, the other co-creator, his assistant, you know, uh, executive assistant went to Hampton. Um, three of the writers on staff went to HBCUs. So it's important to have those voices in the room for authenticity's sake. But um, we're also just telling stories about our people. So it feels um, like you're telling those stories, and it thank you certainly thank feels you like very you're much. telling those authentically. So thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. And it's okay. Like, even if you go, gosh, I really didn't like the story when you whatever. I'm so, I'm interested in that, mm -hmm. you know, because I can learn something from you. So it's all good. That's, I guess, the, the short version is it's all good. <laughs> but they realize this is a drama and not like a documentary, right? Like, things are going to be exaggerated and dramatized well, for the sake of you know, fictional television. Yeah. I, w I would argue, though, if it were a documentary, you'd be in more trouble. <laughs> exactly. That, that's, that's my point. A that's documentary, what my point you was. Know, because I, I the don't goal think... of that is to tell the truth. And, <laughs> right. and while we're taking, you know, lots of our stories come from a very real place. You know, there's the episode where the water gets turned off. We didn't make that up. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we didn't make up hazing. Exactly. But we do try to do all these stories with dignity and the idea that we showed hazing, but we also showed this amazing woman. What we showed that may have been unrealistic in that story is how quickly she was able to get the hazing rules changed. I mean, the rules regarding uh, what happens to you when, when students are hazed change. We did that all in one episode. It obviously, it wouldn't happen that quickly, but that's what we did with that information. It happened, but her goal was to get it, the rules changed so that if somebody did that, there would be severe consequences. So, you know, I hope that people will look at all that we are saying and not just look at the negative that, that, that they're unhappy with. So, hi, this is Joy. Um, Joy. I had a couple, uh, hi, how are you? Good. Um, I had a question talking about your broader writing career. So between writing for Family Matters, Fresh Prince, uh, Moesha, and you and you wrote and developed uh, Soul Food and uh, the, the TV series, you've been mm -hmm. consistently writing essentially black TV gold, right? So how have you developed... Black TV gold, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, um, classics. <laughs> yeah. So how have you developed your six, your sixth sense in choosing what projects, uh, especially black projects to be a part of? Mm. Well, you know, I would love to tell you that I am the master of spotting black TV gold, but um, <laughs> that would just be a big old lie. <laughs> I just, I'm like, well, there's this thing just called the grace of God and that I know I have plenty of, um, you know, it really is true It it that I'm like, I've never been on a show 
that failed. I've only been on hit shows. And then I thought, no, there is that one show that, that I was on. <laughs> that, but over this, you know, 20 plus years of writing, I've been on just hit shows. Nice. And what a blessing that is. And, you know, transitioning from comedy to drama. I have friends and, you know, and people like yourselves who will say to me, when you left comedy, how did you know it was time and comedy was going to be dead for a while and drama was where it was? And I was like, I didn't. I just knew I had an internal thing that was like, I'm ready to do more storytelling than joke telling. I was just ready to grow as a writer. And so I pursued drama and the timing just happened to be right. Um, so much of what has happened for me has just been relationship based. You know, I, I do have a strong faith in God and do feel incredibly blessed, but it has been relationship based that the same women that I met on my first job, Family Matters, who were producers on that show, uh, Vita Spears and Sarah Finney, they were producers already there who were just two black women who saw me coming and took me under their wing. And, you know, and, and gave me advice and said, do this, don't do that, do more of this, stop doing that, or you're going to get fired. And everyone should at their first job be so lucky. But then those two women happened to then be the same women who co-created Moesha. So uh, that kind of thing has just so helped me along the way in relationship building, you know. So I wish it was a more interesting the thing like, well, I did hours of research before I ever entered, and I always look at Nielsen ratings and see what people are buying. It's just not true. I've just been incredibly, you know, blessed and 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 prepared when the opportunities came. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's go more into your writing a little bit. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. where you you proclaimed yourself as a black girl nerd, and um, I think yes. that your career like credentials matches that because you did have a stint in which you were writing uh for comics you wrote for static shock for a couple of issues mm -hmm. um I, teen titans from then yeah, yeah don't titans. sleep on teen don't sleep on the titans oh, no. yes ma'am <laughs> no, we, oh, we know no, your we resume don't. when it comes to comics trust yeah. <laughs> no, <definitely. laughs> um but from that time to now, in, in 2017, there's still a constant debate of the lack of Black women comic writers. Besides mm -hmm. World of Wakanda in terms of the major two, yeah. um, there are really few and far between. So do you have any advice for upcoming Black women comic writers who feel discouraged from the white male comic community? Mm -hmm. I hate the idea that, you know when you say that feel discouraged, it really does deeply affect me because I hate the idea of anyone feeling discouraged from their passion and allowing anyone to discourage them. Um, if anything, what we have to do when there is a door that people don't seem to want to let us in is find the window and um, to not focus on those who would, would want to keep you from where you're going. But you know, be Michael Jordan about it and just only see the basket. You know, you can't see the defenders. You just have to only see the basket. And and I say that knowing that as a little girl nerd, um, I loved comic books. And I really thought, truly, I think, you know, when you're little and you think of all the people that you're going to marry, I remember first thinking I was going to marry Batman. And I really thought that was possible. And... Then, then I thought I was going to marry Michael Jackson. But first it was Batman and then it was Michael <laughs> Jackson, you know, around the time he was singing Ben. I'm like, yes, I'm going to marry yes, him one day. Yes! <laughs> so, but first, before Michael Jackson, there was Batman. And so that was something that was in my soul. And I never thought I was going to pursue a career in it. But I know as a, as a nerd and a sickly child who did a lot of reading and a lot of... Um, you know, wishing, hoping, and creating an alternate universe for herself. I think that that kind of stuff, it, it stayed with me. And so that it all came back around and I got that opportunity. I got the opportunity because I'd already had success in something else. 
I I know how hard it is, and I know that I don't necessarily have gotten that opportunity to do something that you know that I loved since I was a kid. If I would have gone straight into it, so for me the window was, oh, the sort of at the time that that I was approached by DC, it was you did Gossip Girl and Fringe. That's a great combination. So, you know, teens, you know, and then you have some sci-fi in you and that's a great combination for Teen Titans. And so it was the success of, of, you know, my television writing that gave me finally the opportunity to pursue comic books. So in the world that we live in today, part of where I go, where's the window? And the window, of course, is self-publishing. The window is doing it, um, you know, uh, well in a web uh, a web environment or, like I said, or self-publishing. Um, it's just like in television and film these days, like we have the tools. You can, it's so much cheaper than when I was coming up to shoot a short or to write a web series. So... I guess the biggest thing I say is to do what you do and do it well and then find the outlet that you can pursue on your own. And when it's really done well, it, it you can't help that it will one day at some point be noticed. But try not to, I know this is easy for me to say, but to not be discouraged. Because di- being discouraged suggests to me that you're allowing someone else to determine how you feel about your dream. And that's what we have to stay away from. Felicia, this is Karan, and I want to talk to you about your people. Talk to me about my people, <laughs> Karan. Let's go. Now, <laughs> now, we know art imitates life. And the flip side of the whole controversy is that you're putting our business out in the street. And oh. they have this saying in the South that it's always the hit dog that hollers. Mm-hmm. Yes. So... <laughs> My my question to you is, is it just me or are you noticing the only time these kinds of pushbacks happen is when black women are having sex on TV? Hmm. Ow. I really want to say it's just you, but that would be a lie. I really want to say that. I think that um, I experienced this, believe it or not, way back in um, creating soul food mm-hmm. that... Um, we really hadn't seen um, our people be sensual and sexual um, without it being gratuitous and for the sake of of others, you know, or that, or, you know, a a sapphire depiction. Right. Really until on television, until soul food. And I remember people, even your own people saying, well, why in the pilot is she got to be trying to have sex with this young guy? And I'm like, well, why wouldn't she be? He's fine. You know, he's hot. She wants him. Why wouldn't she? And it was just very, very important. Like even a married couple, we just never saw it. Yeah. So it was important to me for, you know, to show a married couple uh, in love and sexual and sexy with it. And, you know, single people, we all do it differently. I wanted to show all of that. And. So there's still something about, you know, our sexuality that makes even us uncomfortable. And partly, I think, because we never see it unless it is, again, for the sex of it mm-hmm. and um, and for someone else's enjoyment. But I'm about doing it for us um, and so that we can quit trying to pretend that we don't do it. Um <laughs> You know, so I'm very much about that and making sure, though, that these are depictions that are not necessarily for the gaze of uh, of another group Mm -hmm. that aren't for othering us, but for normalizing what we do as human beings. And I love the fact that uh, Dr. Fletcher uh, has a a little tenderoni because as the president and founder of the American Federation of the Kuka Coalition, I approve. <laughs> the president and founder. <laughs> I do because I mean we are we are beautiful, we are sexual, we are sensual in so many ways, and we don't see black women being loved on TV. 
period. Yes. And when and we do see a black woman being loved, loved we get this pushback. Yes. And and that's um, thank you for for making that distinction because yes, he is a tenderoni. Yes, Lord. But that's, he loves her. He loves her. And so this is not just about oh gosh. Now, by the way, she's a freak. Mm-hmm. And, I love it. Uh, <laughs> and if they give us a season, you will see what a freak she is. Mm. However, this man loves her. So for me, that is why, look, I, you know, what I mean about this is not for someone else's gaze. This is a relationship between two people. And it's not right. typical where he's just trying to get an older woman and then he's ready to move on. He really has fallen hard and deep for this woman and has made some silly decisions because of it. Uh, is that my phone? Television, television is a really long game. You mentioned before that it's taken four years to get this. Uh, on air Mm -hmm. what uh, what about the quad has kept you motivated during that time what is the thing about this show in particular that kept you moving forward to push to see it through Mm, that is a good question because I will tell you that there were some difficult times along the way where you're like it's not going to happen or you know let me give up on it Um, and I think a couple of things is that I thought about how much our people need to see. And I think it goes back to that feeling I told you the first time I stepped on the Mm -hmm. campus of Howard, that I have to believe that other people could, would feel that too, that feeling of stepping on that campus, if they could see it on television. I wanted other people to feel what I felt when they saw, you know, the environment of people who look like us, who are all there for one reason. But um, that's what I was, I wanted that feeling. I wanted the feeling for others of an audience of what I felt the first time I saw a different world. Mm-hmm. In our next segment, we head over to Austin, Texas, over at South by Southwest. Jacqueline sits down on a one-on-one with the cast and crew of Fits and Starts. Fits and Starts is about a struggling writer who's been toiling away at the same novel for years. His wife, Jennifer, is a literary figure who just released her new masterpiece. When her publisher invites the couple to an artist salon at his home in Connecticut, the pair embark on a twisted journey, and David must face his demons and try not to be too weird among the salon guests and competitive art set in attendance. In this interview features writer-director Laura Teruso, Greta Lee, and actor-comedian Wyatt Sinak. All right, so um, this is Jacqueline, and I'm here with the cast of Fits and Starts. We're here at South by Southwest, and I'm here with Miss Greta Lee, the star, along with the director, Laura Teruso, and also the star, Wyatt Sinak. Uh, Thank you for sitting down with us, guys. Thanks for having us. Oh, great. So last night was the premiere. You guys got to see it with the audience for the first time, right? Um, Tell me a little bit what that was like. It was great. I think it had been a while for Wyatt and I, right? I think it had been maybe more than a year and a half, is that possible, since Since we've seen it. Um, Since shooting. Yeah, shooting. Since shooting, yeah. Yeah. So it was was great. Yeah. Yeah, we shot it the summer before last. And then the editing process, you know, when I, I wanted to take my time with it. Um, and so we cut for a while. And um, yeah, so it was really exciting to, this was uh, two years from when I started writing it to premiering it. Because I started writing it right after uh, premiering Hello, My Name is Doris mm-hmm. here at South by Southwest. Wow. And so coming coming back two years later with my directorial debut, it was like, Full circle. Full yeah. Awesome. yeah. I was just say you want to take your time with it on a, a first one, right? Yeah, Maybe. exactly. People who rush their movies, I'm like, why? You mm. have to live with that for the rest of your life. Like, you know, be be real happy with it by the time you lock that picture. Yeah. <laughs> so. I was sitting closer to you last night. How was it? Was it is it nerve wracking seeing with an audience, or is it more fun? Or it's it's interesting. I mean, I think when there's an audience there, you it's definitely interesting to see how they respond to things and where they laugh and where they have responses to to moments in the film and 
like Greta said, it's been a while since she or I have seen the, the film, so I think there's a second thing that's happening, which is remembering, oh right, this thing is coming up, and then this thing, and oh, okay, they responded to that thing, I remember when we shot that, and just that aspect of it. And then there's the, I think there's a strange insecurity around you've done something and I think I'm the type of person that whether it's doing a show or putting anything out for public consumption, it's kind of like, okay, I did the thing and I'll see you never. And so <laughs> yeah, can't the change idea, it. Yeah. Yeah, but the idea to then, oh, okay, people like there's a Q and A after and I and just being faced with those things is definitely a little, it's a little strange. I think even when I do shows, I'm rarely the person that's gonna go hang out in the bar afterwards and like, oh yeah, let's let's download and like, let's go through it all. It's kind of like, no, you got the thing. So I won't see you tonight after your show. You're not gonna be chilling. <laughs> no, no, I'll be, I will be hiding somewhere. <laughs> Um, well, I thought the film was great. I had such a blast like watching it and laughing with it. My favorite thing I'll go ahead and say, and I don't want to spoil anything, is you were able to write, I don't know how to put this and be delicate, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it, awful white people yes. the best way I've yes. ever seen. I was just and like, it's just a skill, a special <laughs> skill to be able to do that. So I have to ask you, were you submitted to really pretentious and awful, you know, white privileged parties where they made you read like a trained that performer? That is a good question. I want to know. I want to know the answer. That is a good, that is such a good question. I, I I love satire. It's like something that I, I gravitate towards and I just find myself doing when I sit down to write. And, um, you know, and I tend to write about things that I know. And so, you know, I was saying last night in, in the Q&A, it's like with um, Hello, My Name is Doris, we kind of found ourselves satirizing the, the hipsters. Uh, and with this film, we're satirizing the art world and yeah, and the art world is full of pretentious, obnoxious, privileged mm -hmm. white people. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but what's interesting about this question is when you wrote it, I don't think you necessarily had set no. out to No, I never make sit down racial. and go, I'm gonna... Right, yeah, but you yeah. didn't know David and Jennifer were gonna be played by you, oh, wow. like an Asian person or a black person, or it wasn't like that. Yeah. So it's interesting that that... Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. So this was cast blind as far as you just wanted to find the right actors for it, right? Absolutely. Love that. Yeah. It's, it's obviously the so fight. awesome. It is so rare that that happens. Yeah. I, and right? I mean, it's just... I was really lucky in that I, you know, in, in writing the script, I, I think writing is a very mysterious process where you sit down and you basically submit yourself to the unknown in your in your brain you know mm -hmm. and it's and it's like you never know what's going to come out on the page and um in my work it's like uh, yes i love satire but it, it always has to be rooted and grounded in a single character mm -hmm. whose journey we are following and and who we can identify with so in doris it was it was doris sally field and and in fits and starts it's david it's it's why it's character and, and that person grounds us and gives us uh, an anchor to, in which to explore this, the world that we end up in. And so um, I was really, really lucky in that, you know, when I sat down and wrote David, I, you know, I, I thought about Wyatt and I dreamed that Wyatt would do this, but, you know, it, it, I had no idea if he would say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very, very lucky in that when we sent him the script, he read it and met with me and we just, you know, like we got a good vibe off of each other and and, and then from there, you know, I had worked with Greta on uh, High Maintenance. I was a DP for the, the very first, you know, the scrappy season, the mm -hmm. first season of the show yeah. um, and, uh, and met Greta and loved, loved her work and I'm, I just was so fortunate and blessed to be able to work with, you know, two actors who I so respect and like have I just loved for years you know yeah. <laughs> that like 
putting them together was just such a dream because they they're both so funny and also so real and have such a wonderful creative chemistry that uh, yeah, I feel really blessed to, to have been able to work with these guys. Yeah, it translated to the screen for sure. I mean, I believed y'all as a couple, both <laughs> good and bad, and I'll get to that in a minute. Like, like I'll just go ahead and say, it. you're lovely, but I did not like you last night. I was like, yeah. this one. <laughs> we That's okay. To get with it. But that totally. was what was brilliant about it because that is real relationships, right? Not everybody's the hero, right? Right. Um, but going back to that with the two of you guys, knowing that the way that it was cast, when you guys got cast together, was that something y'all talked about as your dynamic as a culture, or your cultural dynamics and how you brought that together as a couple? Like, how did y'all kind of discuss that? Or did you discuss it at all? Or you just said, hey, we're just going to be a couple and, and assume that this is already known? Or how did you go about it? I don't, I don't remember discussing it too much, but I, I think when Laura and I had talked early on, I know one of the things that we had kind of talked about was just that idea of uh that the that jennifer character you know it, it's probably what would make it a a good fit as well is that oh yeah if these are people of color like if i'm doing it then yeah that it would be very easy to cast me and to cast a white woman to play my wife and that just i remember us having a conversation that nothing against that idea but I doubt that 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 character that version of that character would be as uncomfortable in a party like that uh, as David's character gets and so we and so I remember we had a conversation about that going in uh, but then once uh, Greta and I met um, Greta had imposed a very strict thing that we never make eye contact or speak to one another and so uh, this is actually the first time I've gotten to actually talk how to her how many minutes I was like oh how many minutes before you know that comes up <laughs> my very strict um, it was totally fine I, I was very actor. respectful it was very um, respectful other, other people said you know that what she's doing is really mean and, I have a reputation I was like it true. doesn't that's why I really appreciate Laura going out on a limb and, and hiring me despite my reputation. <laughs> um, this is so BS because like, you could tell you guys on screen had no, a great relationship you, on you set. You know what though? Oh my god, you're going <laughs> to kill me for bringing this up, but why, why it's a method actor? Remember that first time we were supposed to meet and you were two hours late? Oh, that's no right. Yeah. <laughs> no joke? Yeah. So you were trying I, to be okay. the character already? No, oh I, my god. I forgot. <laughs> I Can didn't know what time. <laughs> That's even past it was like, like That was really oh, bad. No, it was very <laughs> late. <laughs> two hours late. And but, there's so many snacks. Such nice, nice snacks. But two hours, you go beyond the point of like recovery. Like, like there's no this... amount of snacks that's going to disguise the fact that... You, you know, want to hear a story about how like I was abducted by these sure. guys on the side awesome, of the road? Because I, it's like well, awesome it was in my, stuff happening. No, it wasn't. It was, it was nothing awesome. It was... I thought it was an hour... I thought that we were supposed to meet at like eight <laughs> and it was seven. And so, so then, and then I think as I was leaving, I texted you and I was like, are you coming? We're here. Well, basically, <laughs> that pretty much set the tone. Yeah. For yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, it was like, oh, cool. So yeah, we're, we're married. <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And it was like... I, at all, for a moment, I thought, oh my god, this is genius. Yeah. The producer set this up. Laura, I cannot believe her. This is genius. I and mean, all it was was that dumb dumb can't read an email. Yeah. I will say this, though. That was one thing about the film last night. Because I went into it. I really like it, festival films, not to get too deep into knowing about it. Because you see so many films in a small setting that if you get too deep into each one you don't enjoy them as much so all I really knew was that you both were writers and one was more successful than the other and it was written by you and you did hello my name is Doris I literally that was all I had tagline mm -hmm. going into it and then last night when I got home I was like okay I have to read more but um I loved that I didn't realize that it was the dinner party from hell until I was in the middle of the dinner party from hell and I really yeah. hope that if people go to see that that's the only tagline that they have is yeah. like don't don't okay. you know what I mean like mm -hmm. don't 
won't read too much into it other than that because I loved that whole dynamic. What was that like filming that? Um, because I imagine you're in one place, mm -hmm. yeah, set up. Uh, well, we shot the film in 14 days, which is yeah. absurdly fast for a feature. Uh, and so we were really, you know, we were hustling. I was going to say it was warm. It was very warm. And it warm. was so <laughs> hot. It was the hottest summer. It was like 90 degrees and we're like in this house and it's just hot and Wyatt's wearing a wool blazer for the whole Ooh. damn movie. Yeah. There were scenes where, he, I, where I had him running you don't and he was them. running around in a wool blazer and this man does not sweat. <laughs> it does, it's, I, so, yeah. it's so like, eerie. That's, it's that's just never alien sweat. all <laughs> Possibly hypertension. <laughs> you're yeah. you're yeah. your thyroid. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. I'm just like sweating balls. <laughs> and why was always so dry, dry, just dry, crisp, crispy. Yeah. Every day crispy. Yeah. Never, never, like not a dr bead, not a single Nothing. bead. I'm like completely drenched. Yeah. Red is drenched. Just, yeah. It's Hair like, makeup, just, just throwing powder perfect. in my face and why it's like mud. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, I will say if it was a hard shoot because of weather or whatever else you will say, you could not tell. I, I laughed so much during the film and I really hope people need to see it because it is a great satire. I feel like satire is having a great moment right now with films like this and, you know, Get Out and all of these ones where you kind right. of make a, a commentary on something and just poke the right, the right thing. And I think... Yeah, Climate. ours has become it's ours has almost as much blood as Get Out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a non. I mean, in a lot of ways, I was not gonna lie. I went home. I was like, it's like a non-horror version of Get Out. Yeah. At very many points, I was like, what are these people doing? Um, but I'll go ahead and sum up with this. And again, thank you guys for um, sitting down with us. But we're a site of geeky women. And one thing I always like to sign off with is for you to tell me what's your super secret geeky behavior, if you have any that you like keep hidden. That you wouldn't tell anyone, like the fact, you know. Right? That you wouldn't tell anyone, except right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> or what somebody wouldn't know. Okay. Geeky moment. Well, this I don't know. Okay, I really enjoy Panda Express, and this is maybe <laughs> this is a very more food related thing. But um, I like to get it and eat it specifically on airplanes. <laughs> and I know that's really mm -hmm. rude, but it's like my special thing that Do it. I enjoy for myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then have There's something with food everyone. in certain places. I, I'm I'm down with that. Yeah. I have torchies tacos on Town Lake. I yeah. get that. I feel that. What about you? I mean, I'm I'm geeky. I'm I'm a I'm an out geek. I'm out of the closet. <laughs> Full geek. Like there's well, what, no. What, I, I I mean everything. Everything okay. I do. Is, I can, it's part of my identity. Okay. Like yeah. Well, any particular maybe author genre something that you're into. Ooh. I was going to ask you about a writer writing about a writer, but we ran out of time, so. <laughs> I love reading books on writing. Okay. I find them really inspirational. Oh, that's geeky. Yeah. That's it's so geeky. geeky. That is geeky. For a writer to be reading about writing, it's, yeah. so, it's so geeky. But like Joyce Carol Oates has this book uh, on writing. It's beautiful. Stephen King has a book yeah, on writing. So good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that stuff. I'm a nerd. That's good. That's a good one. What about you, Wyatt? Um... I guess for me, I, I know I uh, am the epitome of masculinity and I exude <laughs> testosterone that you can feel through the microphone. It's, but, it's palpable. Yeah, no, this, this room <laughs> smells like uh, foot fungus, um, which is the most manly of smells. Uh, foot fungus and jock itch. Um, oh Yay, come see our movie! Well, uh, but, uh, the, but in spite of all that, uh, I guess my secret, and it's not, I, it's not a shame or anything like that, but as a kid, I used to really enjoy the cartoon Gem. Oh, that's oh a my God. No, but I was like, I was Wait, a boy. I, I, was, I was a boy this who grew up in Texas. Sure. And as a poster yeah. child of masculinity, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Can we yeah. end this with yes. the theme singing? Song? Gym. Wait, wait. Three, one, two, three, four. Jam is truly outrageous. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. Whoa, Jam. Jam is, is contagious. Outrageous. Jam is my name. No one else is the same. Jenna's my name! Oh my god, y'all are the best interview ever. <laughs> Thank you so <Thanks>. much. <laughs>
Insecure is an HBO original comedy series created by Issa Rae and Larry Wilmore, which is partially based on Issa Rae's widely popular web series, The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. The show also features actors Jay Ellis and Lisa Joyce. Jay plays the role of Lawrence, Issa's boyfriend, and Lisa Joyce plays Issa Rae's co-worker, Frida. We start first with actor Jay Ellis and then Lisa Joyce in this HBO Insecure segment. Hey guys, welcome to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. I have a very, very special treat for you today. Our guest has had us gasping and swooning for quite a few years now. He is insecure. He's my favorite Lazy Lawrence. He is Jay Ellis. Welcome to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Oh, thank you, thank you for having me. That was that was a that was a really great intro. I just want you to know. Why? I thank you. I do try. I figured short and sweet was good for you. <laughs> <laughs> now we love ourselves some Jay Ellis, and many people came to know you from the game. But I understand you are you just got involved with another one of my imaginary loves. You did the video for Bambi with Jadena. Oh yeah, I did. Uh, Jadena called me and um, and was like, yo, I need you for like two hours. Can you come down here and do this thing? It's going to be fun. We're doing this. It's about the video. He sent me the treatment for it. And I was like, man, I'm in, let's do it. And um, I went and worked with, uh, 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 Jadena and his team. He's got such an amazing team um, of just passionate, smart, talented like musicians and filmmakers, and just like such a great group of people. And then he um, he brought in Megalyn, yes, an amazing actress. We love her. Uh, yeah, and came in and crushed it. And we have fun, man. We 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 uh, we we have fun, and and that dude can act. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't get to work with him. Obviously, I got to see him on Insecure, but I didn't do scenes with him. But mm-hmm. I was so impressed by, like, how much, you know, he put the 110% in every single take. It was a pleasure watching <laughs> you in Insecure. How has being involved in Insecure changed things for you? Um, you know, I'm, I'm big for saying it. it I'm always big for saying, like, oh, nothing changed. Life's still the same. Like, I still do the same thing. Um. And I do to some degree, for sure. But I, I will say, you know, um, being recognized is definitely, being recognized as much um, is definitely a different thing. Um, you know, there, there is a, a lot more, the, the, the audience for Insecure is a lot wider in, in, in range and mm-hmm. demographic than what, um, than what the game was. And so, you know, the first time I got noticed about, in the game, on the game, people in town didn't necessarily walk up and like you know fan and fawn over the show as much as they do with a show like as, as they're doing with Insecure. And so, you know, I was at a grocery store one day, and this like forty year old white cat from like three checkout aisles away started yelling like, "Ain't you on Insecure? I'm Lauren. <laughs> hey, I'm just like you. I'm Lauren." <laughs> and you know, like that's so dope that you know, like. This dude who, like, if I passed him in the street, and I would, A, probably would never even think he saw the show, but then not only that, he feels like he identifies with one of the characters on the show. And so, to me, like, that's the thing that I noticed that's changed the most, you know? But, Jay, is being a Lawrence, is that a good thing? Yeah, I, I absolutely think so. You know, I think that, that, you know, I think for us to think that, you know, Lawrence's story, I think what's so interesting about Lawrence's story is Lawrence's story is the story of so many dudes out there, whether it's current, whether it's in the past, whether it's in the future to come. You know, I think that we all kind of get, and, and this isn't just a, a, a male thing either, mm-hmm, but I think mm-hmm. because he's the male character of the show, people identify it too with him, but um you know, we kind of get lost sometimes and we kind of get down on ourselves and we get in our own way and we get depressed and we get, you know, crippled by fear. And and that stops us from being our best self. That stops us from being our best self, you know, in our career path, in our love lives and relationships, um, in our friendships. And so, you know, I think what we see with Lawrence, though, is that he's a, he's, he's a good dude. He's a well-rounded dude. He's mm-hmm. smart. Uh, he's he's got potential to do 
do things and great things. He has ambitions and goals, and he's just a little bit stuck and doesn't know how to get there. So I think what we do get to see, which I think is, is you know, part of the beauty of television, is you get to see these characters unfold over time. But what we get to see is, is Lawrence, you know, kind of fall back into himself and kind of get back on the path. And, you know, even though it's starting with a job that he probably typically wouldn't take, mm-hmm. that just having that job and that, that, that responsibility of being accountable and getting up and going to a spot and bringing in a check, that brings about something in him that, that you know, helps get him back on the right path to then start uh, interviewing for jobs. And then he interviews and he gets a job. And now he's back in the industry that he wanted to be in. And so I, I, I think being a Lawrence is a good thing. I think that, you know, there are moments in all of our lives that, you know, we're not, again, versions of our best self. And I think the great thing about Lawrence is that we get to see him come from that moment and transition into a moment where he is a little bit better version of himself. Now, the 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 the, the heartbreak part of it, I don't think anybody wants to be that part. Um, um, yeah, that but, was rough. You know, that's, that's part of that's part of life. That's part of what happens. Now, we had a number of roundtable discussions around Insecure. We've done Insecure giveaways. Uh, We've been around our little water cooler, our little nerdy space. We've talked about the relationship between Lawrence and Issa and Molly and everybody else. But I really want to know what parts of Jay identify with Lawrence, if any. Um. You know, I think there's a couple of different ways. You know, I, I can identify definitely with being in that space. I mean, you know, when I started acting, you know, I probably had six, seven, eight different jobs. I was probably in a different job mm-hmm. every year, um, every other year, every year and a half or something like that, and, and wasn't passionate about any of them and was just doing them. And it kind of gotten in my own way. You know, I, it, for me, there was this kind of circle where it took me a minute to get back I came out here to act and immediately was hit with rejection. And that's part of what this industry is, 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 is hearing no until you hear a yes. Mm-hmm. And then a couple more yeses. But, you know, that when I was initially being hit with that rejection, I couldn't take that. And I was told it. And I was like, yo, this ain't for me. Like, I'm not jogging across town all day long to be stuck in some audition behind a bunch of actors and then being told I didn't get the job. Like, nope, I'm not going to do it. And what I realized, I was... I was afraid. I was fearful. I was getting in my own way. And it put me in a place where then like now I'm out just doing my version of a, of a Best Buy job. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, for me, I think I can identify that with, with, with Lawrence. Um, I didn't have what Lawrence had in Issa where like somebody could pay the bills. (laughs) Right. Cause we weren't sure about that part. Cause he had money in the bank and we wanted to know why. Well, you know, you know, I mean, you know, I think the thought is that, you know, what we talked about for for Lawrence is that he did have a job before. Um, he probably saved some money, had a good job and probably saved some money mm-hmm. and then also was getting unemployment. So he was bringing in some money, okay. you know, got it. He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't not providing 100 percent, but it definitely wasn't 50 50. OK, got it. Um, so, you know, he wasn't he wasn't a good partner, you know. Um, most of it was falling on Issa's shoulders. But again, you know, I, going back, I just I can relate to that. I can relate to being in that place and and being lost. And then I can also relate to you know the one little thing that helped you turn a bad situation into you know chasing your dream or chasing your 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 calling or your passion. Have you ever thought about turning back? and not acting during those times when you were facing rejection? Uh, have I ever thought about not acting, you said? Yeah, have you ever thought about giving up? Have you ever seriously considered giving up? Because it is a lot of rejection. Uh, no. You know, I think I've got. I've just gotten okay with it. I, and I don't want to say okay with it, but I just understand that in the same way that accountants crunch numbers and are busy from the beginning of the year until, you know, just after April 15th, uh, you know, I've just gotten to understand that being told no is part of 
my job sometimes until I'm told yes. And I don't think of the rejection as uh, a detriment. I don't think of it as personal rejection or personal me personally being told no. I just think of it as I'm not right for that project, and that project is not right for me. Um, because, you know, what's, what's for me is out there and is mine, and nobody can take it away, and vice versa. You know, I look at I look at some of those, you know, some of the other shows that are out there, and there are plenty of them that I auditioned for, and some of my friends got those jobs. And I, for whatever reason, I wasn't the guy. And I'm grateful for that. It, that was their that was their blessing, their moment, their calling. That was their job, and they're supposed to be there. So I don't look at the rejection as as this negative thing on me, I look at it as, all right, well, I just moved to my next opportunity, but this person got that moment to shine and deserves it. Now, I also understand that you were... And I I would never quit. You know, I'll probably be one of those people that I'll be acting from a wheelchair. Well, I'll be grateful to see you in a wheelchair, in the pool, on the side of the road. I'll be glad to see you continuing in film and television. I love you on the big and the small screen. Do you think being a military brat has helped you become better at quick adjustments? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, I think there are situations where I, I realize how I can... Um, I think it's given me an opportunity to just be able to relate to people. Mm -hmm. I I think it's given me an opportunity to be able to adapt to different situations. I think it's given me an opportunity to, to um, be able to understand, have compassion, be able to empathize, to be able to relate um, to situations and to, and to people. So yeah, I I definitely think it's helped, it's helped, it's helped me to adapt. You know, you're, you're constantly being thrown into something new, and you got to figure it out. You got to figure out how you're going to swim, you know? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, you are a brilliant and beautiful man. Your mama's brilliant. Your dad is brilliant. What do you do in your spare time for fun? Oh, man. What have I been doing for fun? Let me tell you. Because um, let, let me just get this in there. Your dad served, what, over 15 years in the Air Force? Yeah. And your mom is like, the chief financial officer of everything. Yeah, she was a banker. <laughs> she was a banker for a while. Yeah, yeah. She um, she um, was a she's she's recently left, but she was the CFO of a of a pretty large financial corporation that owned a bunch of banks for a while. And so, you know, I will say one of the amazing things I learned from my parents who've been together for thirty five years and wow. have had success in their careers and. You know, my dad maybe misses one day of work a year. Like, he's just a get-up-and-do-it kind of guy. And both of them, I will say, you know, outside of the work ethic and my extreme, uh, and my extreme, like, you know, uh, 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 passion for what I do and getting up and doing it, like, 100% every single day, never half-assing it, as my dad would say. Mm-hmm. Um you know, outside of that, I will say you know, one of the things that I did pick up, I have picked up from them is, you know, finding those moments to to celebrate yourself, to relax, to let your hair down, to, to breathe, to to have a little fun. So for me, like, yo, you can call me tomorrow. We, we can go go-kart. We can go do go-karts. We can go do trampoline dodgeball. We can go. Uh, now I, I will I call you. <laughs> <laughs> I just started. um I actually just started uh, uh, yachting classes, so I'm oh, getting wow. a boating license. Uh, uh, I, I I love languages, so I try to get in and out of a language class a couple times a year, uh, usually either Italian or Spanish, just to kind of brush up. Um, so, you know, I, I, I love just grabbing a beer with my boys and watching a basketball game or a football game. You know, I... I uh, you know, I, I find myself, you know, for all the amazing and beautiful things that I get to do, I find myself, like, loving the simple things. Oh, hearts are breaking everywhere, just gasping and swooning. Jay, who's about to be on the yacht, who's going to have a boat and be on the waters, 
I want to thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today. We support you at Black Girl Nerds. Where can we find you online? Um, J.R. Ellis is on my social media. Uh, or my Twitter, my Instagram. Um, the Real J. Ellis is my Facebook. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm usually on one of the three of those at some point. Thank you so much. Any final words for our Black Girl Nerds? Um, yo, stay nerdy. Hey. <laughs> never change. I'm just being honest. Yo, like, just never change. Like, it's just something special that that words can never express um, to the authenticity and uniqueness and the, the, the boldness that it is to be you. So just keep being you. Awesome. Thank you so much. You should come hang out with us at Universal Fan Con. Jay, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Welcome to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. This is Karan. And you know, we are all about that insecure life. And today we have a very special guest. She played Frida, our favorite, our favorite. We didn't know which way the wind was going to blow. Insecurity. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Lisa, to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So tell me, um, how have things changed for you since Insecure has become this worldwide phenomenon? Um, it's It's been such a gift, I mean, to be part of a show that um, I really believe in and, you know, people in my life have responded so positively to and you know, it manages to be just a show about like real women and their relationships, but also have such a bigger effect, you know, culturally, especially right now. It's, it's been really incredible. I mean, starting out, I knew that Issa was brilliant and I was so thrilled to be a part of it, but I think, I mean, I couldn't foresee that it would become what it is now. And it's, it's been really, it's been really exciting. Is Frida a friend? Is she a real friend or is she just trying to learn and figure out what's going on or does she have a motive i think she wants to be a friend i think she's <laughs> one of those people that is like a little awkward herself mm -hmm. and um she's like her own person and she has her own like she has her own kind she kind of like goes to her own beat <laughs> i think it takes people a minute to maybe warm up to her because she's um she can maybe come on like a little strong, but I think she desperately wants to connect to people, which is maybe sort of part of her issue is that she, you know, she could like tone it down a little bit, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, you know, she's like so overly friendly. Um, but so she, she wants to be a friend, but I don't think they're there yet. I think that's something, you know, especially with work friends, you really have to earn and you have to like have real experiences and, so I think there's a long way to go for them, but um, I don't. I don't think she's totally earned it. <laughs> it's fine. Well, she was super sweet, but one of the unique things about uh, their relationship, even though they were they worked together, was that she did have some questions about what to say and when to say it. Did you find that a lot of those questions? come along for you in real life is it is adjusting to the tone of the show was that something that came naturally or was that something you had to work at no I mean I think it's definitely frankly I think it's something that like all like white people should have to think about say white people. and you know <laughs> I mean, well, no, but I, in this context of the show, mm -hmm. like, I really, I really understand it. And you have this, um, this person who's like, she doesn't know. And she, like, I think so many assumptions are made and it's, I mean, you don't want to be like so politically correct that you're like paralyzed, right. but you also need to be conscious of other people's experiences and you don't know until you can like communicate with them or spend some time like in their shoes, which the show allows for. But um, I think that she had a learning curve for sure, but she definitely was open to it. And I think people in that nonprofit world and in the education world, um, 
I have my sisters in that world and I have a close friend that is and you know, they tell me stories about people that are trying so hard to like say the right thing and do the right thing, yeah. but really miss. <laughs> like how how awkward and kind of tough it is because then you have to like bring them back a little bit, and then they're so embarrassed because that was the opposite of their intention. Um, but so Frida, I think there's a lot of that, or there was a little bit of that with her, but I think she's like more aware now. And um, yeah, I, I think that it is it's really just about curiosity um, and not thinking, you know, about other people's like experiences or lives and, you know, asking questions if it's appropriate, um, not making assumptions and yeah. And, and like, and wondering <laughs> yeah. about other people. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, we, life moves so quickly and um, we Put, we put labels on people just to like organize our, you know, our day and like to see what we're dealing with. But if you're trying to build a relationship with someone, you really have to have a curiosity about them. And um, so I appreciate that with her on the show. I completely agree. How did you first meet Issa? Um, I auditioned for this actually. It was uh, like, it kind of came out of the blue and then I watched her web series which was incredible and so much fun. Um, And so I auditioned and then I went through that whole process and I got the job and it was such a gift. You know, she was known in the world um, of her web series, but Mm -hmm. I'm like, it was, it was new to me. And so to get to hear her voice and to get to be a part of this was incredible. It's incredible. So I lucked out (laughs) basically. (laughs) The the cast seems to be so closely knit together. What do you guys eat for lunch? Do you guys dine together? <laughs> yeah, we eat really good catering. <laughs> show provides. Um, yeah, no, they are like they're they're incredible. Like I have such respect for Avon and Jay and obviously Issa and like when Avon and like just came to New York and we went out and like had coffee and just chatted and like kept up and she she um she's a comedian so I got to see her Mm -hmm. stand up and I don't know if you've seen her but she's incredible like she's so funny and so easy going or just uh, such a great thing to see her do but I I, it's really easy to go on them because they're great people (laughs) and they're just like laid back and really fun um, so I'm excited. I live in New York, so I'm excited to go back and hang with them some more. Um, are, are you from New York? Season two. Yeah, I'm originally from Chicago, but I've lived in New York for about 10 years. Okay. Okay. Yes. Season two. Do we have a date yet? Um, I don't know. We started shooting in April. Okay. Um, so I, I assume it'll be the fall again next, like October. September, October, but don't, don't take, I don't know. We are so, <laughs> so, we are so excited. Lead anyone astray, but I assume. <laughs> we are so excited about Insecure season one, which will, um, which is available on digital. And we actually yeah. had a giveaway. We had a giveaway for the soundtrack as well as for uh, season one on digital. What is your primary insecurity? Are, do you see yourself in the characters of this show? Um, what's, what's incredible is I see myself in all the characters. Mm -hmm, (laughs) Like I see mm -hmm. myself in Lawrence in, you know, having to take a job that you feel overqualified for or, um, and in Yvonne, just like what I say Yvonne, but, um, with Molly, you know, like thinking that relationships are going really great. And then like the rug is pulled out from (laughs) under you or, you know, or thinking that like a guy's not that great and then realizing like he was amazing. I'm an asshole. (laughs) (laughs) That you like, I totally see that. And then with Issa, just, you know, in your twenties, like wanting to get the most out of your life and whether it's career or relationship, be like, is this, Especially if you're with someone and you've been with them for a long time or a job for a long time, you're like, this is good, but like, can I, should I be striving for something else? Am I settling or should I be thankful? You know, like all those questions. So they're just really well-rounded characters and they're dealing with really universal 
things. Absolutely. And so, I mean, that's one of the, yeah, it's um, like one of the many strengths of the show is just how relatable each of them are, even though they're so different. Um, and then Frida, <laughs> I, Frida. Yeah, I mean, we purposefully, Frida, we purposefully were like, well, you know, she's not fashionable. She's not stylish. And so Ayana, the um, costume designer, who's amazing. She and I like had a lot of fun with just having her like just dressing her like kind of like a goofy nerd. Yes. <laughs> but I like I, you know, like I see it and I'm like, that's sort of. Like, I have that, especially being in this industry, like, you never feel, like, fashionable enough or stylish enough or, like, fancy enough. And so it was cool to just, like, let it go and be like, well, she's not that. <laughs> I like to own it. But um, that's definitely, like, being in this industry is something that you come up against. And it's, like, it's it's so much. <laughs> do, do, you self, so much. do you self-identify but, as a nerd? As a nerd, of course. Yeah, absolutely. What, what's <laughs> like, your, what's your nerd proud. thing? Um, <laughs> Do you have a thing? Or I'm is nerdy. It just a lifestyle? I mean, I guess. The, I, th- I mean, it's partially a lifestyle. Like, my, like, when I have time off, I'm like, what matinees can I see at Film Forum this weekend? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, what, <laughs> like, you know, like, what books get, which is this, like, great, like, you know, theater here in New York and, like, what. I, I don't know. I'm just like reading books about I don't know, like, people warming. <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm just I'm very like into the environment and film and um, cats. You know, like nerd, like nerd flags. <laughs> that I really, <laughs> but I care about those things. I think I do. So yeah, I definitely self-identify as a nerd. When you sure. were when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you know you would be an actor? No, it's funny. I, I like. I thought I would be like everything, mm-hmm. which makes sense now that I'm an actor. But it was like every week, like an astronaut, the president, you know, like a magazine <laughs> editor. Like it was like every week was something else. And then, but now I get to be different people, which it worked out. Um, but yeah, I didn't know. I know some people have. They just like know right away and. I didn't, my, none of my family is in the arts, so I never really saw, like, examples of that. And I thought, um, like, the profession seemed very far away mm-hmm. and, like, another planet. You know, it seemed, I was like, that's, those people aren't real. <laughs> like, that's not, like, a real thing you can do. Um, so, yeah, it's a surprise to me to, to be doing this, honestly. Which is so funny because my entire family is in the arts. My my dad's side is photography and visual art. My mom's side is music and theater, but nobody did it full time. So when when oh. we started to, to, to work as artists full time, it was like, you can't make a living doing that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely have had like that, you know, for like a decade as well of being like, how do we supplement this effort? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's tough. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's really exciting to talk to you about Insecure, about Frida, and to learn a little bit more about your life. Oh, well, thank you for having me and for the interest. This, Like I said, being part of the show is such a gift, and I'm just any chance to to talk to people about it, I welcome. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. The Black Girl Nerds Podcast is produced by Jamie Broadnax. Various episodes are edited by Jamie Broadnax, M.R. Daniel, and John Bauer. The opening theme song to our show is written and performed by Samus. Various instrumentals are performed by Samus, Sky Blue, and Shubzilla. You can find episodes of the Black Girl Nerds podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spreaker, and Spotify. That was a HeadGum Podcast.